So my name is David Lowry. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. And the passion of my lab is to keep people out of harm's way. And so the way we try and do that is we holistically measure the environment from the global scale using satellites to the very local scale with wearable sensors. And in the project we've just been involved with, we've had an autonomous robotic team. And this robotic team goes into an environment it's never seen before and tries to rapidly characterize it. And to make it a little bit harder, we chose part of that to be an aquatic environment because that has access issues. So all of our different sensors are on robots, they communicate with each other, they use machine learning, and they do that so that they can quickly characterize the environment. Once they've characterized it, they can then produce wide area maps, which can be streamed in real time, that are created actually on board the aerial vehicle on the fly as it's moving. So the project we've just been involved with has lasted about a year and a half and it built on a previous uh, iteration of this project. So what we've done this time is done a focus on the real-time processing. So instead of our robots go out, they collect the data, then back in the lab we do all the analysis and jiggery-pokery. Now they communicate in real-time in the field, they do the real-time analysis and then stream the results while they're out there. So in the previous part of this project, we actually got all the robot hardware together and we tested it in the field. And that in turn was built on projects that have been going actually for up to maybe the last 25 years where the whole approach is we've validated. So because we work from space to the wearable sensors, there's been many aspects of this and this project has benefited from that heritage. The reason for having the Ghost Robotics this time is that our approach is very generic. So really we're about software-defined sensors. And so that could be really expensive software-defined sensors where the software lets us extend their value to new products or it could be really cheap sensors that we're calibrating against expensive reference sensors. So either way, the robots are the ride. So the sensors need a platform to carry them, to give them power, to provide the communications. So in this particular iteration, we added in a package that was on all three robots. The aerial robot, the walking robot, and the robotic boat. So we added in things like the airborne aerosol size distribution because that's useful for air quality, but it could also be useful to respond to a bio threat because typically they will be aerosolized. So we used really small sensing package that lets us um, deploy these in multiple contexts and build the whole back end for the data streaming, showing the dashboards live in real time and actually this same infrastructure we use across dense urban environments and we have right now running live across quite a bit of Texas. The beauty of using machine learning is you may not know the full theory of the associations between things you are measuring and what you would really like to know, but you can have a set of examples. So machine learning learns by example. So today we go out in one context we learn what the aerial vehicle has seen, we learn what it corresponded to in terms of what was in the water, say oil, chlorophyll, or whatever the target of interest was. But the water down the road or across the world is going to be different. So each of these different acquisitions, we can say, correspond to learning part of this parameter space. So we can incrementally build this up over time so we can learn multiple environments. So the longer we continue, the more general our applicability will become. So we don't necessarily learn it all in one go, it can be incremental. But when we compare to what we used to do, just from space, that would take us a decade. So what we collected today in like 15 minutes corresponded to what we had done previously, say from space and uh, ocean-going cruises,
to data collected um, literally over a decade. So it's much more rapid. The beauty of using machine learning is there are many occasions when we don't have a perfect theory of the situation we're dealing with. Ideally, we would like to have a first principle model that can simulate any situation. But when you have so many complex interactions going on, that is a really high bar. However, if we bring together all that we know by using an ensemble of tools, it can be really powerful. So in our work, the, what we do is we bring together three essential areas. We have observations, we have deterministic models, which will from first principles describe a system, if we can do that. For example, if we release a pollutant in this location, where will it go to given the current wind speed and direction? What reactions will it go through? But if we have to have more complex reactions than that, we don't necessarily know or can't describe all the processes. So for that application, we can use machine learning. And the two actually merge together in what we do. The observations, the theory, and then the machine learning is the third element that lets us combine them very powerfully. As our goal is keeping as many people out of harm's way, preemptive protection of the force, those forces, wherever they go, they're in multiple contexts. They're embedded in a really big picture. For example, Hurricane Harvey is heading towards the coast. So that very big picture we see from space. So we're using satellite data to characterize that. But then the minute it makes landfall, the details that are hyperlocal make a really big difference. For example, what is the terrain? So as the water level rises, where is it going to be flooded? And then what is the impact on the human going to be? So we simultaneously use satellite data, remote sensing from radars, live feeds from the various robots, from sensors deployed across dense urban environments, wearable sensors, and they all feed into this single system that we call MINTS, which is multi-scale, multi-use, integrated, intelligent, interactive sensing, and then for actionable insights. So it's called MINTS AI. Because the goal at the end of it all is useful information that we can do something with. My dream is to have these robots to practically help forces in a variety of contexts. So one such context is they may be deployed to a new location and they want to find an ideal base for operations. So our aerial vehicle could go out and do a large area survey, capture the terrain and many of the details of that terrain with the remote sensing component. But then once they've done that, we can identify, say, places that are sheltered so they can have a strategic advantage, either because they're not obviously visible, but yet they can see, they have good line of sight, and or if there were to be a hazardous release nearby, they could be naturally protected by the terrain. So this reconnaissance capability, which will be available out of the box the minute they get to the site, could be of great benefit. Looking forward, there are two key areas that I think will be really valuable. Number one, to have a larger robotic team. So really what we've done so far has been a proof of concept. So you could imagine the next generation, we could have many more members for that team. For example, a larger ground vehicle that could either be deploying multiple robots, such as the walking robots, the aerial vehicle, the boat, directly, or they could also be carrying more reference instruments for characterizing what's in the air, the chemical agents, the bio agents, as we go. And in addition, they could be deploying a mesh network as they go of sensor balls that could be thrown from the aerial vehicle, dropped off by the walking robot, dropped off by the robotic boat or the ground vehicle, which would then form a mesh network and all of those sensors would now be connected and streaming their data live. Another aspect that I think will be really important is to decode our human response. So we have the poor proverbial canary down the coal mine and 
My mantra is like, no canary needs to die. If we can learn the response of us as individuals to our environment and begin to decode it, that's of incredible value. So since we last met, we've been able to actually learn the physiological response to some examples. We found that we can turn our physiological response measured by biometric sensors into accurate particle concentrations. So we have simultaneously a full biometric suit and reference monitors measuring the concentration of different size fractions. And we can entirely, using just the biometric measurements, reproduce what the reference particle sensors were over actually seven different collections. So that was incredibly exciting. So we would like to expand that now to more possible components. And the reason that that would be of use, you can imagine now an operator gets deployed into a context and they can have an early heads up that they're beginning to be affected by things in their environment that could reduce their cognitive performance or maybe be more extreme and take them out altogether.